Hello, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm the author of the multiverse best-selling book, Networking for Nerds. And it's my delight and honor today to present to you a talk, a webinar on poster presentation success, how to design, prepare, and present a winning poster. And I'd like to thank my partners in this enterprise, the AIP Career Network, and all of the organizations and publication that you see below you on the screen. This is such a topic that is near and dear to my heart uh, because most people don't realize the value, the extreme value, the amazing opportunity for value to present a poster at a conference. In fact, most people don't even realize the extent of it. And so what I'm going to be talking to you today is really how to leverage the heck out of designing a poster to make it successfully presented and how to prepare your actual presentation so you present with poise and confidence and enthusiasm and energy and then how to network with that poster because the poster ecosystem actually provides you with such a fabulous opportunity for really high-end networking and so I want to see what we can do to help you get the most out of your experience presenting a poster at a conference. And as for those of you who are joining us around the world, this is being recorded and will be posted uh, on YouTube in the near future, and I'll be giving you more information about how to access that at the end of the webinar. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So what we're going to be talking about today are a couple of things. First of all, I want to address how to actually prepare and design the poster. So we're going to be talking about specific design principles, including what font to use, what colors to use, what colors not to use. Then we're going to talk about how we can put together a pre-conference marketing strategy. So we're going to be strategically marketing and promoting your poster and the fact that you're presenting a poster at these conferences, at these meetings, at these events that you're going to. I mean, you're not schlepping your poster across the world for no reason. You want to really get the most out of it. So we're going to do that. We're going to set up a marketing strategy in advance of the conference to make sure that as many eyeballs as possible will be able to see your poster and understand how you could be potentially a partner for them in a win-win relationship. Now, this also involves social media strategy in advance of the conference and actually during and even after. And then, of course, we're going to talk about how to follow up. You've presented your poster at an amazing conference. How can you really leverage that beyond the conference, beyond the actual poster event to make sure that people really understand how you could be a potential ally for them? Now, let's talk a little bit about a poster. A poster is not simply a poster. I know you're thinking, Elena, I thought a poster is a poster. I was certain it is just a poster. Well, I'm so glad that you thought that and that I'm psychic enough to actually understand that you were thinking that at that moment because I want to help you understand the extent of what a poster is. And I think the word extent today is our word of the day. So I'm looking for people to send me the sources so I can come up with another word. But let's talk a little bit about what the poster is. It, yes, it is a summary of your research findings. It is a story of who you are and what you've done and the problems you've solved. It is essentially a graphically enhanced abstract. So it doesn't mean that we have the entire dissertation on the poster. We're going to talk more about that later. But it's actually just an abstract with images, graphics, charts, things of that nature that are punctuating the text. And the idea here is that it entices others to learn more. So the, the poster itself is dynamic. In other words, it engages the audience. It encourages eyeballs, it encourages people who are attached to those eyeballs to ask you questions. Oh, that's interesting. You did X. Tell me more about that. Oh, I see you solve for Y. Tell me more about your methodologies. So it actually is inviting the audience for your poster to ask questions about it. This is really important. Now, it is also a marketing a piece of marketing collateral itself. In other words, it is a piece of your overall marketing strategy to communicate your value to potential partners. And so this means that it's marketing your expertise, it's marketing your problem solving abilities, your experience, your credentials, your pedigree, and of course it's marketing your brand. And many of you who've joined me before know that a brand is simply a promise of value 
And so we want to make sure that every time we engage with the publics in any way, and in particular, in this case, we're talking about a poster, that we communicate what is our promise of value. And recall that our promise of value in the basics, if, if at the very basic level, is our promise to provide excellence, dependability, and expertise in whatever it is we do. But that brand, that promise to provide those things is also about expectations. So when I see your amazing work on your poster and I see what you've been able to do, or not be able to do. I mean, even if you report on some of your failures, this is important, and I'll talk more about that later. This helps me to understand what kind of a person you are, what kind of a professional you are, what kind of a problem solver you are. This gives me clues as to how you might be able to inject value into my organization, my department, my team, and it allows me to start thinking about you as a potential collaborator. So, and in that same vein, the poster itself serves as an invitation to network and form alliances. In fact, the, the poster is so amazing in that it actually lubricates the conversation. So if you are in a networking environment, uh, typically if you're if you're new to networking, it might be confusing or it might be surprising as to uh, or unsure you might feel unsure as to how can I start a conversation with people? How can I start talking to them to to learn more about what they're working on and see if I might be a good fit in their organization or maybe see if they could even hire me? Well, the the poster actually serves as the conversation starter. And so that's why I'm so excited to talk to you about how you can network the heck out of your poster because it gives you something to talk about. You know, somebody's walking by, you can say, hey, let me tell you a little bit about my poster. Or when you're networking at a mixer at the conference, you can talk about the fact that you're going to be having a poster or that you presented a poster. I'm going to talk more about that too. So hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. So the idea here is that the poster serves as a way to fuel the networking opportunity and it gives you confidence to be able to have something to talk about with people at conferences and beyond because the poster is essentially a large and more detailed version of your business card and it advertises and promotes your brand, your value, values, your, expert, your value, your expertise, and your problem-solving abilities. Now, the poster, ideally, must communicate your findings very quickly and concisely. It has to grab my attention as I walk by. So what that means is you have to have large font to read from a distance. You have to make it easy to read by using easily followed text blocks. I'm going to show you that shortly. It will incorporate graphical elements. And really what it does is it's telling me a story. It's a narrative telling a tale of you and your research and how you solve problems and how you approach the world world as a scientist or an engineer. Now the poster ecosystem is noisy and crowded. Remember you have go to poster sessions during conferences and they are often during receptions, uh, which is actually pretty good. I mean, I go to one conference that has like about 25,000 people attending and the poster sessions take place during the free beer hour. This is really good for you as a poster presenter <laughs> because you're standing in front of your poster while the beer line is, you know, you know, sort of snaking through the poster farm uh, hall and uh, you could potentially grab those eyes to have conversations with. But even if they're not, you know, even if the line for the beer is not right in front of your poster, um, the fact that the mixer is happening in that poster farm at that moment uh, encourages people to have conversations. Now, but people are standing, they're walking by, they're looking for interesting things, they're, they're keeping their eyes open for stimulation. So we want to be able to stimulate them with our poster and entice them to want to learn more, to come, kind of come on over and ask us questions. And of course, because you are so talented, you're going to have throngs and throngs and throngs of fans who are going to want to talk to you, just like in this photograph that you see right here. So we want to get you ready and prepared for that. So as we prepare, let's start by looking at the basics, the essential, find out what the dimensions are that are required for your poster. And I know it seems silly for me to say that. I mean, you're all talented scientists and engineers and other professionals listening in. Why would I tell you to follow the directions? Because believe it or not, people do not do that. They don't do it when they apply for grants. They don't do it when they are submit they submit applications for awards or jobs. And they don't do that when they design a poster. And I've been to so many conferences where somebody brought a poster that was too big. It was physically too big for the bulletin board that it was going to fit on or it was too small. And they thought that the requirements, they just didn't look carefully and they thought the dimensions were very small. So they provided a much smaller version. They didn't use the, the full area of what they wanted, of what they had available to them. So we're going to 
supersede all that. We're going to get rid of all that. And we're going to find out exactly what the organization, what the conference is requiring and suggesting for the dimensions and for the actual poster. Now, there are lots of types of posters out there now. I mean, you see a lot, you still see people, as I say, schlepping their posters and their poster holders across the world, but there are now also electronic posters. So we want to find out, is my poster going to be able to be printed and put up on a bulletin board? If so, how is it going to be put on the bulletin board? Or is it going to be an electronic poster? We're going to talk more about electronic posters and projected posters in a few moments, but I just wanted you to think about that as well. And of course, another thing that's going to influence the design of the poster is your own budget and your own time frame. So in terms of the budget, you know, it, depending on how much money you have available to you, you may print it on a nicer piece of paper. You might print it in something else. I was at a great conference recently, the American Astronomical Society Conference, and this graduate student or postdoc had produced a copy of her poster. She actually printed a copy of her poster on a scarf, on a piece of fabric that she wore as a scarf throughout the entire conference. I felt this was such a brilliant, brilliant idea. Talk about amazing networking and, excuse me, amazing marketing that encouraged networking. In fact, it encouraged me to go up to her and say, what is that around your neck? And she showed it to me and I have actually even tweeted it out because I just thought it was such a smart idea. And so that's something that could be part of your marketing campaign as well. But if you have extra money in your budget, that could be something that you could produce too. And of course, your time frame is going to determine, you know, how much time you're going to be putting into the design. Now, the elements on the poster itself, obviously, we start with a title. We want to keep it engaging. We want to keep it uh, interesting. Some people suggest asking a question. Uh, some people suggest using limited jargon. I would recommend if you can, if you have to use jargon, if you can limit the amount of jargon on the just on the title, because people who are not in your sub, sub, sub field, in other words, the other three people in the world who know what you're talking about, might not necessarily get what your title says. So if you expand it out and use less jargon, that actually makes people want to come up and ask you more about it. If they don't understand the title, you've immediately cut your audience. So we don't want to do that. We also want to list our authors and affiliations. Some people forget to put the affiliations. You can put your contact information, of course. Then we want to identify what was the problem I was faced with? What was the problem I came up with that I wanted to solve? I'm going to talk about my methodology, which was essentially my solution to solving the problem. How did I actually analyze the problem? How did I actually solve the problem? And that includes the experimental design, include the data collection. We're going to talk about what the data said. And then we're going to list out the conclusion. What were the results of your solution? So you have a problem. You have a solution. What were the results of those solutions? And this relates to whether you were successful in the solution, in the, in the solution, in other words, if you designed an experiment that led to X, then that's a success, right? But if you designed an experiment hoping to get to X and it didn't, it's still useful for the scientific community to know about that. And I want to take a moment to talk to you about that aspect of publishing things that don't seem like successes, because I just recently wrote an article for a magazine about scientists who work in high-tech jobs and NPN engineers who work in high-tech jobs. And one of the people that I interviewed actually said that when he looks to hire in particular, PhD scientists and engineers for his high-tech company, he looks for people who have published failures. In other words, they've written papers, uh, either in journals or in other types of publications, where they talk about what kind of problems they were faced with, what kind of solutions they came up with, what were the results, and if they failed, they talk about where they could have gone wrong, why they went wrong, what is the significance of this failure. This decision maker, this person who actually is a hiring authority in his company, actually said that he is looking for that type of thing when he is looking for, for candidates to recruit because he wants to see people who are communicative about what they've done, how they want to contribute value to the community, even if it's a failure, it can help advance science and engineering in the long term. Just a thought I wanted to plant in your head about that idea. So even if you didn't get the results that you wanted or set out to get, it's still useful, perhaps, in your opinion, and of course, in consultation with your team and your PI to decide whether or not you should list it. I think people would appreciate learning about it. And you can turn it into an opportunity for yourself. So you can also list, of course, the significance, the relevance, the impact of your work, and what are the 
next steps. Whether you were successful in the way you expected, successful in a different way, or failed, quote unquote, in a way that you didn't expect at all, what are the next steps that you can take? Where can we take this research? Where can we go with this type of information? Now, in addition, we also want to include, like I mentioned, your contact information. I should be able to see, if I look at your poster, how I can actually get in touch with you if need be. And I'm also going to want to know, what are your funding sources? Who are those funding sources? And you can include the logos from your institution and your funding sources. Here are a few logos. Wow, they're, they're fabulous and pretty. But the idea is, if you got money from somewhere, acknowledge them on the poster. Thank your investors. They will appreciate it. Now, let's talk titles. Your title is the largest type on the poster. It's about 60 to 80 point sans serif type. And sans serif we use for this type of type because it's easier on the eye. But you'll see that with you, when you list out the, when you write out the text of your document, it's actually, excuse me, of your poster, it's actually easier to read in a serif Tech, uh, serif uh, type. Uh, the poster title should be catchy, it should convey your conclusion, or it could convey your question. Um, black on white is best. The reason why that is the case is because if you look at newspapers, and I know some of you may be old enough to remember what a newspaper was, it is, is it, it's actually printed on paper, and I know some of you are old enough to know what paper is. Uh, it's basically easier to read black text on white paper than it is the reverse. The human eye just functions in a better way if it's black on white. So that's why we want to have a white background or a very light background on our poster and use black font or a very dark font as opposed to the reverse. I'm going to show you some examples in a few moments that are going to blow your mind in both a good way and a bad way. So get ready to rock. So we want to keep that uh, high, uh, large type, as I mentioned, 60 to 80 point. And then we want to, if possible, not use all caps. I'm going to tell you why in a moment. Now, the blocks of texts tell the story. So we start with the problem, which is almost the conclusion, right? We start with what, was we, what were we trying to figure out and what did we figure out? So we start with the why. What did I do? What did I add? List the methodologies. What did I find? What are the recommendations? These are what the text boxes, text boxes have, text boxes have on your, pro, on your will, will contain on your poster. A couple of design tips. We're going to use a design tool, a uh, computing program that makes sense for us. I like using PowerPoint to design my poster because then you can just blow it up. But if you're more comfortable on Adobe Illustrator or others, it's your choice. You run the show. Total words. Remember I said this isn't your dissertation? It's not a treatise. It's not a book on your poster. It is an abstract. And so the total amount of words on the entire poster is going to be anywhere from 500 to 800 words. And I think even 800 might be on the high end. You might want to go even lower than that. But the point is, is that it's telling a tale you, the, po the poster presenter, are actually going to fill in the details. So you're not going to put too many details on the poster itself. Some of the details are important, like date, like where you got the data, what the data was, what the impact is, and so on and so forth. But the details, how you came to that conclusion, things about that, you are going to be able to share verbally with the people that you're presenting to. So we're going to keep it short. We're going to keep it between five to 800 words. We're going to try and avoid high densities of text. And as I mentioned, we're going to use a serif font for the body of the poster. So a sans serif and a serif font, the difference between those two is when you see a serif, a serif font tends to have a little edge to, uh, like, the if you look at the T at the bottom, where in the word font, that how it curves like that, that's a, that's a serif. So what we want in the body of the poster is a serif font, so the little edges that come, like a little, like when you make the letter I, a capital I that has the top uh, end and the, top, the bottom end of it, uh, the two horizontal lines on top of the vertical line, that, those are serifs. And so that's good for the body of the poster, but the the poster title is going to be in a sans serif font, so a font that doesn't have the serifs. And we're going to use lists, as I mentioned, instead of blocks. We're also going to avoid dark and image-soaked backgrounds. Remember, it's easier for me as a human, this is important because there will be humans that you'll be interacting with, it is important for me, it's, it's essential for me as a human, if I'm going to read and understand your work on a printed document like that, and also on projected documents, which we'll talk about in a moment, 
that it's not a dark or image soaked background. It just makes it so hard for me to see. So we're also going to watch our colors because remember there are people who have color differentiation challenges. I learned recently from Don Luth, who's a professor at Penn State, that about 10% of the male population have some form of color blindness. And I know my uncle had that. In fact, he had a, he had a blind, color blindness such that he could not differentiate between green and red. So do not want to be in the car with him. Let me tell you when he's driving. However, what the key thing to remember is that for people who do have these color differentiation challenges, particularly with green and red, which you don't want to do, thank you, Dawn, for mentioning this recently to me in a talk that she gave at Penn State, is avoid using green and red in proximity. So an example of this would be in your chart or your graphs that you have on your poster. Don't include, don't make the images, don't make the actual parts of the chart or graph just red and just green right next to each other. Because then I'm not, if I have this problem, if if I have this challenge, I'm not necessarily going to be able to tell which is the data that is positive and which is the data that's negative or which when you asked everybody about this particular thing, when you took a survey and you have a bar graph and one bar is red and one bar is green, I'm not going to be able to tell the differentiation between the two. So just keep that in mind. OK, now I know this is going to blow your mind, but what if I told you that typing in caps does not improve your argument. I know you would freak out and that is possible to happen, but I don't want you to freak out when you're listening to this. So I want to thank Don Luth again for, for giving me this fabulous meme recently. Um, you don't have to include all caps on your poster. In fact, don't include all caps in your poster. And interestingly, um, in general, don't include all caps in anything that you do. I mean, I occasionally send an email where I include like one word in all caps just to be either funny or to be very insistent. But if I was writing to Dr. God or a Nobel Prize winner or a potential employer to discuss how I could potentially collaborate with them or how I might be able, how if we could have potentially an informal conversation or an informational interview, I'm not going to type it all in one in caps. It just is totally unprofessional. And guess what? It just does not improve your argument. Okay, down the world we go. Now visuals enhance the story, right? So we're going to include charts, we're going to include graphs, but we want to make sure that they actually help to tell the story. So in other words, they're not there just to be cute, they are there to actually punctuate the text and communicate something. Everything on the poster, this is really important to, mo to make a note of in your mind, that everything on the poster has to have a reason for being there. OK, everything has to be have a reason for being there. Similarly to your resume and your CV, nothing should be fluffy. Nothing should be there just to puff it out. And same thing with the poster. The images that you select have to be there for a very specific strategic reason. Now, the charts and graphs that you choose to put on your poster should be easy to read from far away and they should be easy to interpret. In other words, I don't need to have to read a treatise to understand what this chart is saying. The pictures themselves, if you use photographs, you want to include a scale bar, of course, right? And you want to include a caption so I understand what it is that I'm looking at. That's always really important. And I told you I'd blow your mind in this talk. I'm about to blow your mind again. Look at this amazing, dramatic, just amazingly artistic and brilliantly talented drawing that I did myself. I know you're shocked that I had this type of artistic talent in me, and I just am, I'm thrilled to share with you how talented I am in art, uh, as well as in science, career consulting, and comedy, which is totally obvious. But art, you might not have realized it. I did this myself. Yes, it took seven hours, but it was worth it so that I could help you be better in poster presentations. Look at this design layout. How simple is this? We're going to go from the corner, the upper left-hand corner, we're going to go down, then we're going to get, have another text box that's in the center that goes down, and we're going to have a third text box that goes on the far right that goes from top to bottom. Okay, that's your design. Wow, amazing. I know. I want like a cigarette. It's so great. Okay, so now let's talk about text sizes. How do you actually put the text on the poster? The title about 85 point, the authors about 56 point, subheadings 36 point, body text no less than 24 point, captions 18 point. Remember, when we write a document, like an essay, a paper, a, a resume, an email, a letter, we're writing in no more than a 12 point font. So we're going from anywhere from 10 to 12 points in the font size. 
If this is the case, think about how small that is. The captions can be no less than 18 point, but the body text has to be about 24 point and definitely no less than that. Anything less, people are gonna need a magnifying glass to look at it, and we don't want that to happen. Now let's talk about electronic posters because I've been sort of dancing around that concept for a moment and this is really important because I'm seeing more and more conferences incorporate different versions, different types of posters into their poster farms and into their poster presentation opportunities. So one type of electronic poster could be a poster that is your, let's say it's you made it in PowerPoint and it's, let's say it's a PDF, right? And they take that PDF and they actually just project it on a screen. Another type of poster could be that it's projected on a large monitor. Now, if it's projected on a screen, if it's on a large monitor, these give you different opportunities in terms of how you present your material. So we want to be thinking about this. So if the, um, if the conference and the presenting association has the opportunity to, has, gives you the opportunity to present an electronic poster, Find out how big the screen or the monitor is. How big is that, that monitor going to be? Is it going to be, you know, horizontal or is it going to be vertically uh, posted on the wall? This is important because you might have to change your design. Is it, are you going to be using your computer to project it or to uh, communicate to the monitor or theirs? And so with all these considerations, we want to get there as early as possible and then we're going to bring like 17 different versions of the poster, especially for you fun folks out there who use Macs. And I'm migrating in that direction, by the way. I just want to be clear. You're my peeps too. But we know that when you use a Mac versus a PC, there's different considerations. There are different cords and things of that nature. So we need to know what it is that they're going to need the poster to be presented on, whose computer is it going to be on, and we're going to bring several different versions. So we're going to bring it as a PDF, we're going to bring it as a PPT, we're going to bring it on our computer, we're going to bring it, send it over on Dropbox, we're going to send it over on Google Docs, we're going to email to them in advance, we're going to email to us ourselves so that we have a copy electronically to grab through the Wi-Fi. And we're also going to send it by carrier pigeon, by floppy disk, by zip drive, and by telegram. Not Instagram, but telegram, because we want to make sure that we have all of our bases covered. Because I can tell you, having presented oral presentations as well as poster presentations at conferences, I can tell you that for these types of scenarios, 16 out of the 17 can and will fail and you will be thrilled that you sent it by telegram let me tell you so we want to make sure that you have all your bases covered so you don't even have to worry about that part of it and with electronic posters especially those on monitors you might be able to zoom in you might be able to include animations and in movies which is going to be really cool make sure they have a reason for being there right they have to have a strategic purpose and we also want to make sure that it doesn't distract from the content of the actual presentation and the poster. So, but it can be something very useful to include. So you want to find out what the system is that you're going to be using so that you'll be able to do that. You're also going to, even if it's an electronic poster, you're going to have printouts of the poster ready to give people pre-printed out and you're also going to have business cards to give people which describe who you are and if you're still a student if you're still early in your career maybe you're a postdoc you can just put you know Elena G Levine of course if that's your name you can use that but Elena G Levine you know candidate PhD physics the University of Arizona may or postdoctoral associate the University of Arizona Department of Physics you could put a couple of things a couple of um, uh, three words or three phrases that describe your area of expertise your email address your phone number and your LinkedIn profile that's the stuff that goes on the front of the po of the front of the business card I'm going to tell you what's going to go on the back of the business card in a moment and I'm you're going to freak out you are going to have your mind blown so get ready for that so these things are going to be useful, they're going to be props, but they're necessary for the networking opportunities that you're going to get in the poster ecosystem. Some tips to think about how to really make sure that your poster shines. You're going to proofread it. You're going to proofread it and you're going to have a few other people proofread it as well. Certainly you want to have other people proofread it who are in your group. That's very useful. Uh, your PI, your collaborators, your co-conspirators. Uh, I would also have somebody proofread it who is not an expert in your area or might not even be in science or engineering at all because you never know. You might have spelled 
physics wrong throughout the entire document or maybe you misspelled physics in the title wrong but nobody caught it because they were just too close to it but then you have your mom who is not a physicist take a look at it she's not a physicist she's a chemist of course and she looks at it and she realizes that you misspelled physics you wrote psychic instead we want to change that she catches it because she's not an expert in physics so these are the kinds of things that you want to be able to catch if you're too close to the problem you might not be able to see some of the copy editing mistakes that you've made or things that you could potentially improve. One of my favorite ideas for you to get input as to how to improve your poster, print it out, put it in your office hallway, and put next to it a Sharpie and a pad of post-it notes and a little sign that says, could you please comment and po on my poster? I appreciate your anonymous feedback to improve it. And people as they walk by will give you input. They, and because it's anonymous, right, because you're not going to Dr. X, Dr. Y, could you take a look at this and tell me? I mean, you should do that anyway. But to get other anonymous feedback, you put this up in the post in the hallway, people will stop by, they'll put a little post-it note with a note on your poster on the section that could be improved, and you'll get some really great feedback, feedback that you might not have expected. So that's really useful. Also, you want to convert the poster into a PDF. Of course, you do that with any of your marketing materials, right? Your resume, your CV, your research statement, all of those documents you always convert into a PDF before you send it anywhere, before you print it out anywhere, because you want to make sure that you have complete control over how it looks. And if somebody, if you produce it in a PowerPoint on somebody else's computer, they might have a different version of PowerPoint, which means the fonts might not carry over, the images might be screwed up, the, the uh, format might be screwed screwed up and we want to have control over everything so we convert it to a PDF before we send it before we email it before we bring it with us um, I also like to do this I like to project the poster onto a wall in the office before I actually print it to check the formatting at the actual size because you might be using X point font or you know 24 font for 24 point font for the uh, for the uh, text in the text in the body of the poster and you might find on your computer that that looks pretty big but then you go and put it on the screen you are you, you project it onto the wall in your office and you realize that's actually not as big as you thought so you want to go a little bit higher or maybe it's too big maybe you chose a higher size font and then when you project it on the wall you see that it's enormously screechingly big so you can reduce the size so doing that saves you a little co saves you cost right because you don't have to print it and then reprint it and then reprint it again and in general with with posters especially in large conferences where people are not in your sub 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 field or not everybody is in your sub 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 field you want to watch your acronyms and watch your jargon you can use acronyms just spell them out first and put the acronym in parentheses then you can use the acronym again jargon you can use if you need to feel that you need to provide a definition of that that might be something that somebody who is walking by your poster anonymously in your office in your building could potentially give you feedback on they might not necessarily know that jargon because they're not in that sub 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 field so just watch your acronyms and watch your jargon okay I want to give you some examples of posters that are really awesome and some that are not so and I'm going to thank my uh, colleague here, Colin Purrington. I'll give you his contact information at the end. He had a bunch, a bunch of these posters on his website. Now, this poster is produced just to teach people what not to do on a poster. Okay? Now, I can see that there's quite a few things here that are kind of interesting um, and also are kind of distracting and maybe don't necessarily help me read the poster so a couple of things here that I noticed immediately first of all the background of this poster is dark it's the you know it's the cosmos it's the blackness of space but it's so hard to read white on black so that makes it difficult to begin with but then what he does is he has very very like light uh, uh, very um, excuse me not light very dark uh, text colors on top of the dark background which makes it almost impossible to read and very challenging to read another thing you'll notice is that um, we're not in Star Wars right we're not watching Star Wars um, and so your title should not look like it belongs in the credits of Star Wars which is what he did just to teach uh, you what not to do um, he has an image there in the bottom left hand corner you see a, a wonderful photograph but 
you don't necessarily know what that is unless you look extremely, extremely careful. I had to look at it about 15 times to understand what that image was, and there's really no point to that image. And I'll just tell you what that image is in case you can't decipher it yourself. Of course, the title of his poster is Pigs in Space, the Effect of Zero Gravity, etc., etc. So he has a little, I guess, a little pig sitting on a uh, sitting on a scale. Now, isn't that clever? Wow, that's wonderful, but it has no place in this poster. So it shouldn't be here because there's really no reason for that image. Another thing that's really, really bad about this poster is if you take a look at the conclusions, that bar that has the conclusions, the, excuse me, that text box that has the conclusions, you'll notice that you there's no break in the text. It's just the text goes the almost the entire length of the horizontal length of this poster. So you can imagine that if you were standing at the poster, you would actually physically have to move your body, you know, a few feet to the right to read it, and then a few feet to the left to begin again, and so on and so forth. That is very difficult to read. So we don't want to ever do that. We want to have text boxes that are short in their width as opposed to long in their width. The poster itself, other elements that could be improved, the text boxes, you can't really tell where the beginning is. Uh, you know, it's sort of all placed in different ways. It's, it looks like it's almost placed in random places. Uh, there's no sort of format that, that is consistent here. I think things could be a lot, could be improved quite a bit with this, and I know you would agree as well. Here's another poster, another one of my posters that I just love. Um, this poster, <laughs> you're going to love this poster. This poster says... Um, and you might not even be able to see this, but it, this poster actually says, the title of this poster is, if you can read this, you must be nocturnal. Now, it's, it's a joke, of course, because I can't even read that. I had to actually stand up and look right at the text at a strange angle to read it. Otherwise, I couldn't read it at all. But this goes to the point of dark on dark, just on a poster, does not work. And this background is so dark, you can't even see anything. And then he used the black text on top of the dark blue. You can't read it unless you're not a human. I mean, if you are nocturnal, you could potentially read it. And if you go to a bat convention where only bats attend, this would be perfect. But we don't belong in a bat society. We live in a human-based society. So we have to adhere to human-based sight standards. Another really interesting thing about this poster that I did not like and again, this poster is designed specifically for people to, as a teaching tool to learn what not to do with posters are those images. I have no idea at all what those images are. I mean, they could be uh, like I think they could be nerve cells. They could be galaxies forming. They could be bed bugs. They could be microbes on my forehead. I have no freaking clue what those are they did not the person who wrote this poster did not provide any sort of caption did not provide any sort of context for what that image is so this is a bad idea but we're going to get to better in better uh, posters in a moment we're getting better we're getting better with the poster this poster is getting better it has short blocks of texts it has good colors uh, it has the good white background with the black and the dark blue on the white, so it's easy to read. It has the logos. Uh, it is missing the contact information, so that's important to remember to put on it. I think the subtitles of the sections could be a little bit better, maybe get into some more detail in the, in the title, the subtitles as to what the problem was, what you did, what the impact was. Um, the images are kind of interesting, but some of them are a little hard to understand. They have the green and red together, which is hard for somebody who has green and red color differentiation issues. So I think there's some things that could be improved here dramatically, but I think we're getting on the right track. This is an interesting poster. I like this poster for, a re a, a, for reasons I'm going to uh, reveal in a moment. This poster's title, Will Manatees Still Exist in 2100? That is a real question. I am excited to know that. I actually want to know if manatees will exist in 2100 because as I build my time machine, that is something that's on the forefront of my mind. Will they be there if I go 100 years in the future? Now, that image on the top right-hand corner is an image of a manatee. But I'm not a manatee expert. I don't study manateeology, so I don't know necessarily what the image of the manatee does in the in this poster. In other words, there, maybe there could be something a better image that would be uh, more more complementary to the manatee community that you could put on this poster. What I like about this poster is the light background. It's a little bit on the, the darker side, but it's it's still light enough that you can read it. Uh, he he has the dark 
uh, the dark writing, which is good. We have the uh, introduction, the objectives, the methodologies. I like that. I mean, it's the same type of, uh, uh, it's the format that I described to you in that amazing drawing that I made where you start with basic, we have three basic uh, columns of text. You start in the the, bot, the upper left-hand corner, you go down, then you go to the second column, then you go to the third. So it, the eye can naturally follow that. I think that's really good. One thing that can be improved, if you take a look at the, the, the center column where it says for results, graphs of population trends, the person, the author lists model one, model two, model three, model four. You can't see it unless you look so carefully. I didn't even notice it until recently that this person actually put some arrows that are pointing to those graphs. The arrows are white on a very light background, so you can't even see that. I think the arrows are a very good use of a graphic design element on the poster, but because it's white on this very light blue background, you can't see it. So I think he could improve it by just putting a border around it or maybe making it a slightly different color from the background. Uh, so this is, a, this is a better poster. What's missing also here is uh, any funding sources that the author might have had. Uh, and then perhaps also the um, uh, some of the uh, better, uh, I think the, the graphs could be increased in size, the captions could be a, lo a larger size, and there's some other things that could have been done, such as um, talking more about the impact. This is another interesting um, um, poster, which I like, Southern Flounder Exhibit Temperature Dependent Sex Determination. Those are pictures of flounders up there. I guess I can, I can figure that out. Again, I'm not a flounderologist, but I think I could figure that one out. I think if this poster was a little bit light on the text, I think this poster needs more text to explain the story. The histological analysis, which is in the bottom left-hand corner, I think could use a better description. I think it could use a scale bar. Uh, the colors are a little hard to see, so I would actually change the colors. The, on the, the, the right-hand column, we have those that bar graphed in red and blue. That might be challenging for somebody who has the red and green. I'm not sure, but maybe it could be improved by changing the color, maybe providing a little bit more contrast. Uh, I think this, could, this is definitely on the way to improving, to being a really great poster, and I, I applaud the authors for this. This is a really nice poster, this, this next poster. What I like about this poster, can suburban greenways provide high quality bird habitats? Well, first of all, I like the images. There's lots of images on this poster. I think it makes it visually interesting for the, for the reader, for the viewer. I like the uh, use of the subtitles in these blue text boxes. So now, even though it's white text on blue background, because there's not a lot of it, it punctuates the poster and it actually provides a very nice visual element and helps me follow the story and know where the text box boxes are, where the borders are. So that's actually a pretty good idea. I thought that was really nice. Um, the person, there's a picture of a person here. I'm not sure what the purpose of that was. Maybe they just wanted to show themselves. Uh, uh, the uh, Some of the, in the center column and also in the right-hand column, you see that they have some graphs there which are a little hard to read. I think that could be improved upon. Uh, maybe some of the other pictures could be changed a little bit. And uh, we certainly need some scale bars too. But I think we're, we're doing pretty good on this, I think we could be improved by uh, adding a little bit more detail, maybe um, improving the images, maybe taking away one or two of those pretty photographs and exchanging that for maybe some more text to explain what the uh, impact is or what the, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more about the study design. But I think we're getting towards something really good here. And now this poster that I want to show you, this final poster is the last poster in my poster extravaganza. This poster actually won an award. This poster won a poster design award and a poster communication award. So I want to applaud the authors, Pamela Speciale and Whitney Baer from the University of Texas at Austin, the Jackson School of Geosciences. I spoke there last year and uh, their advisor gave me a copy of this poster after they had just won this award. And I just thought this was such a great poster. I wanted to point it out to you. So what are some really great things about this poster? Uh, first of all, it's white, black on white, so that's really good. It has the uh, post, it has the text boxes, very easy to follow. They even number the text boxes. Uh, they have the logos. You can't see one of the logos on the left just because that's where the camera flashed, but that's my fault, not the fault of the uh, author of the posters. They also have their contact information. Um, they have references cited. I think that could be just improved by not having it so long. I think if we, if we, if they cut it into two columns instead of one, 
double column, it would be better. I also like, what I like about this is the photographs. So the photographs of the rocks were very interesting and it provides a useful element for me as a reader, as a viewer, to understand the story, to, to, to understand the significance of the story if I'm not in this area of geology. This will be useful for me to see. And then they have the conclusions, they have their assumptions and approach. So this is a very nice poster and I think they did a really good job. So some final thoughts about posters and then I want to talk to you about the networking aspect of the posters and then we're going to take some questions. So don't worry about that. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to send 17 versions of the poster ahead of time and we're going to take 17 versions of it with us. But one thing you're definitely going to do and some people just don't do this even in this day and age, they don't print the poster before they get on the airplane. They assume that they'll take it on the thumb drive or they'll email it to themselves and they'll print it at a FedEx when they get to the poster, excuse me, the conference site. You're gambling with that. You don't know what's going to happen. I've been to conferences. I mean, I've been to particularly the American Physical Society March meeting, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people at that conference and a huge percentage of them are all printing their poster or using the FedEx Kinkos that's on site at the convention center. You don't want to have to wait with a thousand other people to print your poster and then you know what's going to happen of course you're going to be 998 in line to print your poster and the 997th person will get the last large piece of paper and you will be out of luck. We don't want that to happen. We want you to be completely confident that when you go to the poster and you go to the conference that you're ready to go. So we're going to print the poster at home and we're going to take it with us to the conference. We're also going to print mini versions. So we're going to print PDF versions on eight and a half by 11 sheet of papers to take with us. And you know what we're going to do? We're actually even going to pin those to the bulletin board next to our poster so that if somebody wants to have a quick copy of the poster to take with them, they can. I mentioned business cards. You're going to bring, bring with you business cards and I'm going to give you a fantastic tip right now. So get ready to write this down or to mentally incorporate it into your brain. I love this idea so much. Your business card, on the back of your business card, what you're going to do is you're going to put a sticker on the back of your business card and you're going to produce these in advance and you bring these with you. The sticker is going to have the name of your poster or if you're giving an oral presentation, you can do this too. The name of your presentation or poster, the uh, date, time, and location of where it's going to be presented and even a QR code so that if somebody wants to scan it, they can get an electronic version of your poster. You're going to put that on the back of your business cards. Imagine how awesome you will feel, how confident, how professional you will look and feel and actually be. When you're meeting with Dr. Nobel Prize at the conference, you're both enjoying a drink, you're both enjoying some delicious meatballs, and she says to you, hey, what are you going to be doing at this conference? And you say, well, thanks, Dr. Nobel Nobel. Actually, I'm going to be giving a poster. Here's my business card. And by the way, on the back of my business card is all the information about where my poster is going to be taking place. I hope you can attend. I'd love for you to stop by. Wow. Wowie, wow, wow, wow. You will rock it. So we want you to totally kick butt at this conference. That is such a great thing to do such a great marketing tool and there's nothing wrong with that because it's totally appropriate. This is appropriate self-promotion. So by putting it on the back of your business cards and giving it to people as you meet, this is going to be such a great thing. And then you know what? You'll also have those business cards with you at the actual poster presentation with the information about your poster on the back of the business card. This will be useful because you'll be giving out your business cards as you're chatting with people about your poster and they'll have the reference on the back of the business card as to what you discussed, where your poster was to remind them of what you talked about as well as that QR code so they could get more information. I would also include with me, I would put on the next to the poster uh, a sign up sheet that says if you want more information please give me your email. You can include copies of your paper if you want and then one of my tools that I always take with me when I have a poster is I bring a sharpie and I bring white correctors tape. This is to fix mistakes because after you review it, after everybody in your lab reviews it, after your mom and brother review it, after the neighbor down the street who you haven't talked to in five years reviews it, you will 
find maybe one mistake on that poster after it's printed. Maybe it's a comma. Maybe you misspelled conference. Maybe it's something small. But we want to quickly be able to fix it. We'd rather own the mistake and fix the mistake than have the mistake glaring. And that's why the Sharpie and the white correctors tape is so useful so that when you have the poster up there and you do see that you misspelled your name, you can quickly white it out and then, you know, use the Sharpie to put it in. Better than that, then they call you by the wrong name. Now, you're also going to, in this wonderful age that we live in, we live in the space age, we have all these amazing mobile devices with us, right? The iPad, the iPhone, we have all sorts of things we're taking with us, so we can bring our poster and related resources such as our CV, our resume, our, uh, you know, our LinkedIn profile, we can have them already loaded on our iPad or on our mobile phone to go, and this is useful because if you're walking around the conference, you can have it ready to go. So if you do run into Dr. Nobel, you can talk to her and show it to her on your, your iPad. Or when you're giving your poster presentation to have all that material, let's say other animations, videos, movies, pictures, other charts, other graphs, anything that would be potentially helpful for anybody who wants to have a more detailed conversation with you about your poster title, about your poster subject, you'll already have it on your iPad or your phone ready to go as you're giving your poster presentation. So if they ask you a question about X, you can say, oh yeah, absolutely, let me show you a video of X on my phone or on my iPad. It's also an easy way to quickly be able to email or send over the electronic version. Now, in advance of going to the conference, we're going to build buzz about our poster because the poster is serving as a platform for networking. And remember, networking is not about me trying to get something from you. Networking is about me trying to give something to you, trying to inject value and contribute value into your team, into your organization, into your research organization or group. And so it's all about building mutually beneficial uh, partnerships. That's what networking is about. So if that's the case, that means that as I communicate my poster, what I'm actually doing is I'm communicating the value that I've developed or understood or discovered as part of my research that could potentially help other people, other professionals in the field with their problems. In other words, I'm communicating how I've solved problems and how my understanding of the, of the uh, community and of the scholarship will help you solve your problems. That is absolutely honorable. There's nothing more honorable than trying to help another party solve problems. So this is effective, this is appropriate marketing. So we're gonna invite people to meet with us at the conference by communicating about our poster. We're gonna invite them to the poster and we're gonna invite potential companies, potential PIs, potential collaborators. We're gonna invite anybody who could be a potential ally, a potential collaborator with us, for us, with us, together with us to our poster so they can learn about it. We're going to give out copies of the business card, as I mentioned. We're going to also prepare a elevator pitch, a 30-second commercial about what it is that we do. And we're going to prepare multiple versions of this. It's good. One's going to be for somebody in your sub-sub-sub-field. Somebody's going to be in your sub-field. Somebody who has a physics or a physical sciences background. Somebody who's a scientist but not necessarily a physical scientist or a physicist. Somebody who's an engineer somebody who is also a potential employer or a potential collaborator or the general public. So we're going to have multiple versions of this. Case, most important point to remember is this. You are not dumbing it down to be able to communicate your value and your problem solving abilities and your passions. You're not dumbing it down by changing the way you communicate it. And as a colleague of mine, Brian Mallow, the world's foremost science comedian, Brian Mallow says, and I just heard him say this recently at a conference, he says, is it dumbing it down if somebody is speaking French, if somebody is a French speaker, is it dumbing it down to speak to them in French if that's the only language that they speak? Absolutely not. It is not dumbing it down. You are simply speaking in their language. So we're going to comp we're going to prepare multiple versions of our elevator pitch in multiple languages so that anybody who speaks a different language from the one that we use in the lab every single day will understand what it is that we could potentially do with them. That's not dumbing it down. That's keeping it smart. That is smart communications and strategic as well. We're remembering that we're trying to respect the audience. So we're going to keep our pitch short, anywhere from 30 seconds to less than two minutes. We're going to jump to the conclusion, discuss the relevance, the significance, the methodologies, and give examples. Good case, a good way to think of it, a good framework to, to 
put together when you're building your pitch is what was the problem I was faced with or I came up with or I realized existed? What was the solution I came up with and what was the result of my solution and what was the impact of that result? As we build buzz, we're going to tweet it. Tweet out that you're giving this poster. Use the conference hashtag. Use the conference organization at sign so that people know, people see it in the twi Twitter feed. Post it on the group's Facebook page. Post it on the group's LinkedIn page if they have one. And certainly email potential collaborators to view it. And if they can't make it, offer to send them a PDF of it. Now, when people approach, engage them. Smile, you're happy. This is happy times, right? Happy days are happy physics conferences. Happy physics conferences lead to happy, happy days. So we're going to enjoy ourselves there. We're going to give them eye contact. We're going to shake their hands, smile at them, say my name, say their name. Remember, it's kind of noisy, so we're going to speak a little bit louder, perhaps. And you have the advantage in networking because you have information to share, and that's everything that's on your poster. But you have to be ready to explain anything that is on your poster. Anything that you mention on your poster, any image that you put up there is fair game for anybody stopping by to ask you a question about it. So you have to stand by your poster and know exactly what every element relates to so that you can clarify it for somebody if they ask you a question. Now, there's a couple of different types of publics that you're going to be interacting with, actually not a couple, a few, and in particular, I want to address three types of publics that you may interact with. One is the hidden decision makers, number two are the aggressive, aggressive inquisitors, and number three are the whack jobs. So let's start with the hidden decision makers. This is something I started realizing just a few years ago. We're at a physics conference, I'm giving my poster. Somebody walks by, I introduce them, this person, Dr. X, is with his spouse, Dr. Y. Dr. X, I, maybe I know, or maybe as he interacts with me, he introduces himself as somebody in my subfield, so we start talking. Now, Dr. Y, his spouse, is standing right there. Dr. Y, I don't know anything about. Dr. Y could be in physics. Dr. Y could be out of physics. Dr. Y could be working for Microsoft. Dr. Y could be Bill Gates, for all I know. I have no idea who Dr. Y is. Dr. Y is a hidden decision maker to me at that moment. And so when I am communicating my value and communicating the value of my poster, I need to make sure that I am communicating it both to the person who I am interacting with at that very moment, the Dr. X, the person who I know or will be communicated to me in just a moment, who is a member of my community, as well as his partner at that moment, his spouse or his, the person who is accompanying him at that moment. They may not say anything in our discussion. They may stay silent, but they are hidden decision makers because they're watching you. They're looking to see how you communicate. They're looking to see how, you, how professional you are, how you engage them as well. They may not say anything, but you, you look at them as you speak. You look at both the spouse and the Dr. X in the equation. You're respecting all three people, yourself included, in this equation. They're watching that, and they're making decisions as to whether or not they want to engage you or whether or not they want to tell their buddy, Bill Gates, that they should hire you or they should at least bring you in for an interview. You never know. So we're going to be extremely respectful to everyone. These hidden decision makers are everywhere. They're usually accompanying people who are in the community, attending the conference, and they could be walking by your poster. Now, there's also the aggressive inquisitors, right? These are the people who want to come and ask you questions and dig, 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 not because they're interested in learning more or engaging somebody like yourself who's excited about what you do, but they're interested in tripping you up. They're interested in asking you detailed questions about things that you don't necessarily have anything to do with because that's X and you've been focusing on Y and your poster clearly says that your focus is on Y. So these aggressive inquisitors, you have to be as respectful as you can to the point of them disrespecting you. What you can do is you can say, you know what, thank you so much. That's a great question. Let me get your contact information. I will follow up with you later. You know what, thank you so much. I don't have the information about that, but I could potentially follow up with you later. Or or, you know what, that isn't something that I focused on in my research, but I really appreciate you bringing that up. It might be something I'll look, look into later. Thank you again. And then turn your attention to somebody else. But the idea is deflect, deflect, deflect as much as possible. Now, the other kind of party that will show up at science conferences are the wackos. And these are very benign. And for the most part, some of them are also aggressive inquisitors. But I find that the whack jobs just tend to be you know, on another planet. They just happen to be visiting Earth at that moment. They are in your orbit. Be respectful to them. 
don't uh, disagree, you know, don't necessarily say, you know, you're wrong. Evolution exists. Let's let's have a fight about it. I, 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 you know, challenge you to a duel. You don't have to do that. You can just say, you know what, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. I'd love to talk to you more. You can get their information and then move on to the next person. But to be as respectful as you can to the wackos. Poster presentation tips, we're going to be professional. Remember, there are no small posters. There are only small poster presenters. But you guys freaking rock, so you're not going to be small poster presenters. You're going to be amazing. You're going to be confident. You're going to be cool. You're going to be collected. You're going to wear appropriate clothing. You're going to, if you step away, you're going to leave a note. You're going to leave a note when you're going to be presenting so people know. And you know what? Your poster extends into the future. So there's a lot of things you can do with your poster in perpetuity. First of all, we're going to take it as a PDF and we're going to post it on our LinkedIn profile. We're going to make a note of it on our CV and our LinkedIn profile. We're going to offer to post it in the department. Leave it out on the wall. You never know. Somebody else might get an idea and want to collaborate with you. There are visitors to the department all the time. They may see it and get an idea and want to talk to you. It's a great marketing tool. You might as well make the most of it. Offer to post it on post it on your blog, make it into a business card. It's part of your permanent portfolio, so you can print it out and bring it with you to job interviews, put it on an online portfolio. But the point is, is really, really leverage the heck out of it. You put so much work into the research and so much work into the design, the preparation, and the presentation and the networking with the poster. You might as well use it in the future as well. This is such a great opportunity for you. So with that, I want to thank you so much. I want to acknowledge these uh, these kind people who uh, I helped me with this this uh, workshop today this webinar Don Luth at uh, Penn State uh, Kay Powell CB Purrington L Graves and also uh, NCSU they have a wonderful website as I mentioned this webinar is recorded you will be able to see this later I'll send you some more information too there are some really great resources that you should take advantage of from the AIP career network the careers toolbox for physics students is meant for undergrads but I got to be honest with you it is such a great resource, so detailed, so it dives so deep into career opportunities and what you can do with a physics degree, it actually extends beyond undergrads. I think graduate students, postdocs, even people beyond postdocs can really use this. It's a great tool. It's free from the Society of Physics Students, so take advantage of that. Also, I write a career column for physics today. You can get information by going to this website. And of course, my, my, my book. I know you want to bring it to other planets that you're going to be visiting, other exoplanets, planet nine that you're going to be visiting soon. So this, if you want to get a copy of it, you can go to this website and get more information. I'm going to be sending you a survey to get your feedback as to how we can improve this webinar and other webinars. This will be sent out shortly. And then make a note in your calendar, folks. OMG, on 14th of April, 2016, we're going to do a webinar on amazing oral presentations, and you are finally going to get to see me. I'm actually going to have a camera on me. I'm going to speak directly to you about how to give effective, amazing, awesome, great speeches. This is going to be Levine Live. It's going to be the event of the century. I hope you can come. It's going to be so much fun. I am looking forward to it. Thank you so much. This is truly an honor and a privilege to present this type of webinar for you, this talented audience. I want to thank the AIP Career Network for their support of these endeavors. I hope you'll thank them too. I'm going to stick around for some questions because I know a few of them came up. But thank you again for this opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you on in April, if not elsewhere, on the conference trail and in front of your amazing, awesome, just super super ter terrific poster. Thank you so much, you guys. You rock. Okay, so now I'm going to take some questions, and some questions, some really great questions came in. Um, so somebody asked, um, when you print your poster as a PPT or a PDF, or when you convert it from a PPT, a PowerPoint presentation, to a PDF, some animations, or in fact all animations, because you're printing it, animations and certain dynamics disappear. So how do you deal with this? So, of course, that's the issue, right? So what I would do is I would think about, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. What I would do is I would think about making two versions of your poster in that way, In this, in, in, if this is the case. So one version would have the animated version that would be the animations that would be on the electronic poster. Another one would be a static 
poster that's just images, just printed images, so that uh, when it's printed and when it's printed, you know, you, you won't get something strange because the animation has been converted into an image. You want to have control over that image. It's a really great, a really great point. Another person um, asked, uh, I wonder about the ideal poster word content, picture graphs used in the poster. So the word content, just to remind you that the, the amount of words is anywhere from 500 to 800 words max. It's an abstract, it's a graphically enhanced abstract of your research findings. So there's a couple of things that you can do with that. Uh, you want to just keep the, the text boxes that you, you use those to uh, contain your text and just keep your text at a minimum if at all possible. Now, those were all the main questions I got today. If you have other questions, I will be producing a companion article to this webinar, which will be published in Physics Day or on Physics Today's website as part of my career column for them. So if you have other questions about posters, I'd be happy to answer them anonymously in that article. So just send me an email. There's my email address, Elena at ElenaLevine.com. Otherwise, again, thank you so much for your kind attention today. Enjoy your next conference. I'm really looking forward to seeing your presentation and to seeing your poster. This concludes our webinar for today. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you again.